Please open your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I want to read with you verses 14 and 15. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. The scripture reads, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now according to this writing of Paul, the law of Moses was nailed to the cross of Christ. That, of course, would be when he was dying. But there arises in the mind of some, and I've seen it over the years come up from time to time, that if the New Testament church was not established until the first Pentecost following the resurrection and ascension of Christ, then what about the people who died between the death of Christ and Pentecost? How were they saved? And that's a good question, and in studying it, we'll better understand something about the nature of law and the institution of new laws and old laws, even among men. A change in the law must be effected by removing the existing law and then enacting the second law in its place. Statutorily, the first must remain in effect until the second law takes its place or supplants it and then is made binding. Now, if that were not the case in one law or the whole body of law, then there would be no law. And God has never left mankind without some kind of law from him as to how man is to live on this earth to be pleasing to God. Now, if we study further, we'll find this procedure expressly stated in, the, in this case. And again, the letter to the Hebrews is a great one to understand about the first and the second law or the uh, law of Moses and the law of Christ and their relationship and how long one functioned and when the other one started. In Hebrews 10 and verse 9, the procedure we just mentioned is expressly stated. Then saith he, Lo, I am come to do thy will, O Lord. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now the implication is, if the first remains, you can't have the second. If the second is in effect, then the first must have been removed. Earlier, this had been clarified in verses 18 and 19 in the seventh division of the book of Hebrews. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect. Now watch it. But the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh or near to God. Again, Hebrews 7, 18, 19. That pretty well sets out the whole theme of the book of Hebrews. God had the law of Moses. It was his law. It was for specific purposes, specific people. It did just exactly what he intended it to do. But you couldn't have another law, which was a better law, and that would still remain in effect. The first one would have to be abrogated before the other one would be in effect. So we see then that this was speaking of that law that is mentioned by Paul as being nailed to the cross in the passage we started with in Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. And it was removed, the law of Moses, by the death of Christ on the cross. Now the law of Moses was built around and maintained an annual observance. 
Again, back to the book of Hebrews. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Then he goes down to verse 3. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now it took care of the situation for the time because those faithful to the law of Moses will get the benefits of Christ's blood shed on the cross for the remission of sins. Even as Abraham did under the patriarchal law or any of the patriarchs of that matter. But those laws were temporary and provisionary. They were not to be permanent. They were worked into the very development of the scheme of redemption and the journey that mankind had to make in man's development until the fullness of time was come. When it was exactly right for Christ to come to the world and do the things he did. Galatians 4 and verse 4. So under the law of Moses, the Jews each year renewed their covenant with God. And they did so by their animal sacrifices and various offerings that the law laid upon them. And it's interesting to remember that the Jews regarded Pentecost as the commemoration of the giving of the law of Moses to them at Sinai. Deuteronomy 5 verses 1 through 5. And that was 50 days after what? After Passover. We mentioned some of that on the Wednesday night class regarding what it pointed to, and it was not just an act within itself, but it all had to do with the unfolding of the scheme of redemption and in the law of Moses, a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. So we see from this passage and from the Old Testament that this renewal was made year by year as the Jew faithfully kept the law of Moses and offering those sacrifices. Well, there were multitudes of devout Jews, Luke records, assembled in Jerusalem on Pentecost, and that was after the death and the resurrection of Christ. The offering on Pentecost the year before was now again due. Sort of like the IRS, April 15th. Every year it was to be done. Well, it was to be done until that day they lived under the benefits of that offering. So it was a perpetual thing for over 1,500 years each year they did that. That, will, of course, was a reminder. That's why, besides it being the thing that all men ought to do to fear God and keep His commandments, that's why when they followed the law, it kept alive. In their minds, the need of forgiveness of sins and pointing them to the Messiah who would come and accomplish all that they could not do. So until that time came, then they had the law as a shadow of good things to come, the writer of Hebrews says, pointing them to those things. Jews, not knowing the law had been removed, would have been living in respect to that law and also justified by its stipulations. Now that's how you run into the problem you do well, after the church was established in the Jewish mind relative to the big problem they had that had been going on for 1,500 years and was brought on by their adherence to the law of staying completely separate from anything and everything that had to do with their, if you please, their Jewishness, their separation. That's why Paul would talk about Christ came and broke down the middle wall of partition. Well, that wall of partition was right for a long time because the law enjoined it upon the Jew in order to be faithful and to remain what God wanted them to be. But they, they didn't have a proper understanding of it. So when it came time, even though they recognized Christ as the Son of God and those on Pentecost obeyed the gospel, but we learn from Acts 15 that certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed were determined to make the Gentile a second-rate citizen. Still in their minds, there was that business that a Jew, according to the flesh, as a descendant of Abraham through Jacob, just had one upmanship on everybody else in the world. So Gentiles, in their mind, just could not be 
all that they were. And frankly, you can begin to see to a faithful Jew under the law why it would be that way. If you just study some history of the times, the corruption that was in the Gentile world was just uh, an abhorrence to the faithful Jew. Well, where did the proselyte come from? Well, he's a Greek that sees... He's got some good sense, if you please. He is a Gentile who sees the better moral life the Jews are living. And he chooses himself to say, why? Let's go learn and let's go see. And they chose um, themselves to become proselytes. And when you read of the day of Pentecost that Luke records in Acts 2, the day the church started, then you will see that there were all these Jews, and it will say proselytes, gathered from every nation under heaven. They were there to do what they would do as those who were proselytes under the law of Moses. All of those were in that multitude there gathered on the day of Pentecost. They would have been judged, that is the Jews, all those under the law, while it was the way the Jews approached God, they would have been judged by the law. Now we could spend a whole lot more time on searching this out in detail, but I think this, at this point, gives us a clear understanding that when you've got one law binding, you can't have a second law different binding at the same time the first one's binding. One's taken away so the other can be established. That's just a paraphrase of what's said in the book of Hebrews anyway. The Gentiles were never under the law of Moses such as all men are under the law of Christ today. They never were. When you look at Cornelius and his conversion in Acts 10 and a rehearsal of it by Peter to the Jews in Jerusalem in Acts 11, as Luke records all of it, then you will see there's no indication at all that Cornelius and his household were like those proselytes on the day of Pentecost. He is still approaching God as a devout man. If you read the word devout there, you will find it's the same word applied to the Jews on Pentecost. Devout men gathered out of every nation under heaven. He was devout under patriarchy. He's an uncircumcised Gentile. He couldn't be a proselyte. He couldn't at all. Jews wouldn't allow him. But he is doing what he's doing, and God says, your prayers have come up as an alm before the Lord. And in effect, what happens in this transition stage from the law of Moses, as far as the Jews are concerned, to the gospel system, and patriarchy on which an uncircumcised Gentile could approach God, though few of them did, to the gospel system where all men must approach God today for Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes to the Father but by me. John 14 and verse 6. He has all authority in heaven and on earth today. And His New Testament is binding on everyone today. But at Cornelius' household, here was a man the Jews wouldn't even accept though they recognized the kind of life he was living. So... Peter went in unto him contrary to the law of Moses. Even took witnesses with him who were devout Jews. And he was called in question when he rehearsed the event of the, con of the conversion of Cornelius that Luke records in Acts 11. You went in unto men uncircumcised. Well, they didn't have that problem dealing with proselytes. So why have they got this problem? Because he wasn't a proselyte. He is the first uncircumcised Gentile to believe and obey the gospel. That's why it is as significant as it is and recorded as it is in Acts 10 and 11. Notice that Cornelius and his household spake in tongues by a miracle. It wasn't through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And Peter could only remember the other time that happened. And he says, as it was upon us at the beginning. The beginning being the beginning of the church in Acts 2 on Pentecost. In other words, God spake directly from heaven and gave his sign to those Jews that uncircumcised Gentiles had a right to hear the gospel and be saved. And Peter learned something from the vision he saw on the housetop of Simon the 
Tanner and then when he got to Cornelius' house and he said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feels God and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. That couldn't have been said while the law of Moses was in effect for the Jews. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 1 through 5, where Moses, before his death, is rehearsing the law of Moses to the Jews about to go under, led by Joshua to take the land of Canaan, he says this law was not given to our fathers, but it was given to us, even us, even all of us who are alive here this day. So a proselyte just had to take it upon himself, and the law made provision for that to happen, to live as a Jew. But that's not Cornelius. Cornelius could have never obeyed the gospel if the law of Moses was still in effect. It had to be removed and the gospel system in place, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, extending the authority of God through Jesus Christ to all men to be saved by the gospel, which is God's power unto salvation, Romans 1.16. Paul understood that. And that's why he says what he does in Romans 1.16. But there were a heap of Jewish converts who didn't, and they began to cause problems in the church. And it happened just as soon as these uncircumcised Gentiles began to be obedient to the gospel. And where does it show up first? It shows up in a Gentile church in Antioch of Syria where certain come down from Jerusalem teaching that you can't be saved unless you circumcise keep the law. And that did not sit well with Paul and Barnabas. And into it they got. Well, why did they have... The meeting at Jerusalem in Acts 15. It wasn't a matter to determine the truth. It was a matter to determine where this doctrine came from. Paul as an apostle as well as the other apostles had the Holy Spirit giving them all things pertaining to the truth. They didn't have to wait on somebody to come to Jerusalem and tell them what they ought to preach. They already knew. Every apostle had the wherewithal from God via Christ through the Holy Spirit to remember everything perfectly Jesus ever taught and be, have revealed to them all other things necessary to have the completed New Testament. So as soon as that false doctrine reared its ugly head up in Antioch of Syria in an uncircumcised Gentile church, if you please, not to say there weren't Jews or proselytes there, but that's primarily what it was then they took issue with that doctrine immediately because it was contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Well, if the law of Moses hadn't been taken out of the way, there would have never been a Gentile church in Antioch of Syria. There would have never been a preaching of the gospel to the Samaritans as it was. And isn't it interesting that the plan under taking the gospel to the whole world was that it was to start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, then Samaria, and then unto the uttermost part of the world. And when you read Acts, you see that development. And you see men having to be changed to understand the things we've been talking about. And the first thing they would have understood would have been this law of liberty, this gospel system, this New Testament cannot be in effect if the law of Moses is still in effect. The law of Moses had to be removed that the law of Christ might come into effect. So all men today are amenable to God through the law of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 12, Paul said to the church in Ephesus that they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now that was the stage of the Gentile who was doing just as he pleased and that's what most of the Gentiles did. Just read Romans chapter 1 and the great majority of all non-Jews desired not to retain God in their knowledge and they lived just like the Roman world lived. But it was because of the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross that they were made near to God. Again, Paul talks about that And he does so in that great letter that has more to say about the church than any one letter in the New Testament, Ephesians. In Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16, notice how Paul reasons with them. Speaking of Jesus, for he is our peace, I've already made reference to this once, who hath made both one 
you and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, between Jews and Gentiles. Watch it. Remember what we started with in Colossians 2, 14 to 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that's hate, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain or two one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God. In other words, the reconciliation of all men, Jew and Gentile, in order to a given end. What is that? And unto God. In one body. Colossians 18 says that body is a church. By the cross, having slain the enmity, which means hate, thereby. Well, I don't know how you could say anything any plainer, really. It was because of the death of Christ on the cross that they were made near to God and near to one another. The fellowship all men can have with God through the belief in the same gospel and the fellowship they have with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. There's only one death that is recorded during the time from the cross to Pentecost. And Peter said of Judas that he might go to his own place. That's Judas Iscariot. Acts 1 verse 25. But I would say anybody that died faithful as a Jew between the death of Christ and Pentecost would be acceptable to God. For the simple reason... He destroyed the law, if you please, in the sense of its power and its authority at the cross. But the gospel system didn't come to effect except when the church was established, and that was 50 days later. What about all those thousands of people in between? They kept on doing what they knew God wanted them to do. And it's a transition period, and there's always leeway. We see, we see that in the transition from patriarchy to Judaism. When did the Jews receive the law of Moses? It was some time after they left Egypt. But they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So Paul says, when they passed through the Red Sea to escape Pharaoh, they wandered for a while, but they got down to Mount Sinai. And then we know the events there, but there's where the law was given to Moses. Do you ever notice that they stayed there a whole year after the law was delivered to them? You see, they could not immediately begin to practice that law as soon as it was placed in their hands. Why is that the case? They had to learn it, first of all. And if you'll just look at what was required of them in the way of building the tabernacle, all of the utensils of the tabernacle, the clothing of the high priest and the priests, all of that had to be put into effect after that law was given to Moses and he brought it down Mount Sinai. So they couldn't immediately begin to practice it just when they had it. It's always been that way. You can have a law passed right now in Washington, but it may not be the law until January the 1st, 2018. Well, then what law are we under until then? The old law <laughs> that it takes away. So it's not that difficult when you think for a minute that God wants all men everywhere to be saved. But he saves them through a law. But he took one law out of the way. When did he do that? When it was nailed to the cross. But the other law didn't come into effect. It wasn't fully preached until Pentecost 50 days later in Jerusalem. And you have the record of Peter's sermon right there as he stood up with the other apostles and preached Christ and him crucified, so the Holy Spirit gave him utterance. Well, then what about these people all in between? They kept on doing what they knew, because you can't do deliberately and purposely what you don't know. You may accidentally do it, but nobody's ever accidentally practiced New Testament Christianity. But they knew the law, and they kept living it. That's why that you had to, Peter in such a surprise when he came to the conclusion after all the events around the conversion of Cornelius and his household that he was so surprised. He didn't realize that the gospel was for uncircumcised Gentiles just like other Jews didn't. 
Now, how long that was after Pentecost, I don't know. Some people say as much as 10 years. I don't know how they arrived at 10 years. But it was some time after the church was established that they weren't preaching the gospel to anybody but Jews. And in effect, you can see, really, the wisdom of God in that because he gets the church well established among the Jews before it even goes to the Samaritans. And then especially before it even goes to the uncircumcised Gentiles. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, if you look at the systematic unfolding of things in Acts, had to be called first. And the first record of Paul being converted is in Acts 9. Now what happened in Acts 10? Cornelius, an uncircumcised Gentile, is converted to Christ. And then you will see that it gradually, well, not so gradually, really it almost abruptly centers on Paul after that. And Peter and John and others who were the limelight, if you please, the spotlight was on them earlier in Acts. Now they go by the way because the gospel goes out to the Gentiles. And the whole history of the church of our Lord the Jews predominated in it only for a very short time. Because after the fall of the nation of Israel in AD 70, the Jews are scattered everywhere, and that's believing Jews and non-believing Jews. They have no nation any longer. The unbelieving Jews cannot worship according to the law. There is no temple. They don't know where the Levites are. They don't know where the priests are. There's no use for a civil nation of Israel any longer. Christ has come according to the flesh. did everything he said he would do. They rejected him in general. Now they're gone. But it doesn't get rid of Christianity. Because people understood before that ever happened that the Gentile had a right to the gospel. And so it just takes off after Acts uh, chapter, or rather after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And it moves right on to the point that the whole empire is disturbed over it and the whole empire or government of Rome begins to bring to bear the power and might of Rome to try to destroy them. And that wasn't because of Jews. That was because of uncircumcised Gentiles being converted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's important to understand that God has never left man without law. And the people who lived between the time of the law being taken away at the cross and the church being established continued to live under the law of Moses as Jews. Because there weren't any Gentiles uncircumcised. They were all being approached. That wasn't time for that. Well, I hope this has been somewhat helpful in the right division of the word regarding laws and when one comes in and when one goes out. And it will help us to have a better understanding of the Testaments and the abrogation of one that the other might come into effect to take its place is the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. If you're not a child of God, this afternoon is an excellent time because really it's the only time you have to become a Christian. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You need to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, and complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you're a child of God and you sin, then we urge you to repent of those sins or sin. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. We serve a loving God. He's so loving that He gave His only begotten Son to die for us. He does not want us to be lost. He wants us to be saved. And he's allowing time to continue so that man can be brought to knowledge of the truth of the gospel Believe in Christ, repent of their sins, and obey the truth. So we need to be thankful to our God for His mercy, for His grace, and giving us our time on earth to grow and to develop to be like Christ or to learn the truth and become Christians. In either case, to be faithful to Him. If you need to obey the gospel, then we urge you to come to Christ while we stand and sing.